like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Sandra Leal, and she's the Missouri Lewis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation, HSSU coordinator, as well as the chair and associate professor of biology in the Department of Mathematics and Natural Sciences at Harris Stowe State University. And her talk, How High is Hemp? Harris Stowe students are putting cannabis oil, oil to the test. So please help me welcome Dr. Leal. Thank you. And uh, I'm really glad you're here, and I'm excited to share our story. It's a story in progress. Uh, fasten your seatbelts. So I'm going to start giving you some background. I'm happy seatbelts. I know, but you know what? You can imagine that you have a nice little seatbelt, and you go click, click. Your imaginary seatbelt, and we will take off. We will take off. This will be a, hopefully a a fun talk. Oh, well, we could get through. So we already did that. All right. So. I don't know if we have any history buffs, I know we're here for science, but I always like to start my talk by giving just a little background of marijuana and where it started. And actually, it started a very, very long time ago, 8,000 years before the birth of Christ in China. And this is the goddess known as Megu. She's the goddess of, of, um, uh, of hemp or marijuana. And uh, this is a culturally a very valued, has been a very valued plant in that society for a very, very long time. And we'll get to the science soon, I promise. But just to say that this isn't anything new on our horizon. Hemp has been around and marijuana has been around for a very, very long time. In fact, uh, this gentleman, Shen Yong, was the very first person to actually, or documented at least, right? There could have been people already using it, not documented, but he was the first to actually recommend uh, medical uses for this, again, back in, in China. And believe it or not, these hieroglyphics at the top of the Egyptian um, picture here actually spell out in um, hieroglyphics uh, cannabis. So from China to Egypt, uh, you had people all using uh, marijuana and the plants that collectively refer to as marijuana. We'll get to, into that later. There's several different species. But for now, um, before 1500, the now marijuana is just spreading all over the world. But it starts more making an influence <laughs> in the Middle East, in countries like Iraq and in Syria, and again, Egypt. And I did bring handouts. Uh -huh. This is my secret little storage. I don't have enough for everybody. Um, but sure. Um, I'm going to hit you. I made it just if you were interested. This is something if you're bored on a, an evening and you want to know more about the 6,000 year history of cannabis. And I'm sorry you cannot read this. It's a little blurry. I don't intend to read it. I'm just going to say that the point of this slide, I'm using it for, is just to show this arrow here going to the United States of America. <laughs> and also here to South America. And so you have now, as history proceeds past 1500 and into the 1700s, you start to see with the imports and uh, trading uh, globally back in the day that now we're starting to see it spreading, this plant spreading to the new world. Now, even colonists used it, and they used the plant to make rope. So a lot of the rope um, the colonists used back in New England, um, early 1700s, 1600s, these people um, were basically, 1700s, were basically using it for a lot of textile. Um, and believe it or not, back in the day, you could pay your taxes with hemp. Mm. Wish we could do that now. <laughs> so, so that's true. That's a true, that's true. You could use it as legal tender. So what is hemp used for? Well, once again, it is actually used for shoes, jeans. You can make very durable clothes out of it. And then what I brought here in my little goodie bag of surprises is rope. So I've actually brought, I'm going to pass it around. This will be a somewhat interactive talk. I'll pass this around. I like to smell it. I'll start here. This is made out of hemp. And I bought that from Walmart. Walmart, of all places. That. All right. So that is rope made of hemp. In fact, a lot of your food and your beverages, and I'll start on this side. This is a, maybe some of you have seen this marketed. 
got this at just any local beauty shop or Ulta, you know, you'll see this. Do it. It's got hemp oil in it, a little hemp oil. So foods, beverages, cosmetics, lotions, um, you can actually use the hemp seed to extract hemp oil. And it's high in protein, so if you're looking as a dietary supplement, you know, again, there are dietary considerations for using um, hemp in food and beverages. Now, a lot of you probably know this already. If you're health conscious, they tell you to right eat foods rich in uh, omega-3 fatty acids, and salmon's a good source of that. Uh, walnuts are a very good source. And it turns out that hemp oil beats all of those. It has the highest, actually, the highest amount of omega-3 fatty acids and also calcium and iron. So again, as a nutritional supplement, this is something that has a high, hopefully a high a nutrient value that could be used in the future. Um, other uses, paper, um, could be used globally to make paper. Believe it or not, there is an environmentally friendly form of concrete called hempcrete. So you make concrete out of it, insulation, plastics, get a load of this. Do you know who that is? That's Henry Ford. Henry Ford, back in the day, made a car, a prototype, made completely out of hemp and soy plastic. And he said, I can make a durable car out of hemp and soy plastic. And he took a hammer to it in the 1940s to show that he could successfully build this car. And he was marketing it for durability. Now, did he sell any? No. <laughs> but he tried. All right, he tried. So it was very creative on his end to do that. Uh, finally, just a few other things. Hemp is good for uh, making gas, diesel, but no one really in the United States is, is using it for that. But a lot globally, you'll see other countries are really thinking about it. You know, usually, I hate to say North Korea, they have a slide. I don't want to show North Korea, but um, they're actually, North Korea is really investing a lot in, in hemp for uh, making biofuel uh, for their drones. Okay. And also chemical cleanup. So you, actually plants can be used to clean toxins out of the soil. And it turns out that hemp can actually do this very nicely. It can be used for something called phytoremediation, taking the toxins out of the soil. And once they get processed in the plant, they get converted to something that is not a toxin. And so it's actually used to clean up the radioactive fallout from the Chernobyl disaster in Russia, believe it or not. So, a lot of wonderful, broad range of uses. So, yes? So you're saying that um, on the uh, chemical cleanup, the plant doesn't become radioactive or anything? It can still be used for other things? Now, I don't know that, uh, to be honest, I didn't look into that, like exactly what they did with the plant when it's done. Um, that's a good question. I yeah, because know. most plants, whenever they clean up, you know, you see that used in um, cleanup sites and stuff like that, um, and also water um, For this particular example? You're really not supposed to I'm not or sure. do anything with it. I have news for you. I wouldn't yeah. throw it in the regular waste, yeah. personally, yeah. or if I was you know, managing yeah. toxins. Yeah. But other toxins, as long as they do tests and they show that they're clean, I'm yeah. sure they can put chemists do. They can improve it. Now, again, this was in Russia. And, you know, we don't get much knowledge out of Russia. Although we're really tight when it comes to the space program, I'm not so sure. I mean, this could be a, sorry, I don't know the answer, but it's probably something I will look up now that you brought it up. And you leave me your name and email, I'll send you the answer. Because I'm curious. It's a very good question. It's an excellent question. And I wish I could answer that. Yes. So, did Henry Ford, uh, was he able to recycle that car since it was uh, made from hemp car? I don't know. Don't know the history of that. These are just examples. I have no idea. I have no idea. Next time I'm in Detroit, that's a good question to ask when we go to the board, to the museum. So here's my question for you. The title of the talk is Hyper Hemp. So I'm going to ask you guys, collectively, did you believe everything, sort of? I just told you. You had great questions. So um, do you believe now hemp can be used for, you know, just you have to believe it. I wouldn't lie. Of course, it's used for great things, right? Here's the cross section of the stalk, and it's used again for all kinds of um, manufacturing, 
from the rope you, I passed around to paper bags, shoes, uh, biofuel, yada yada. Hi from hemp. I said hemp. Sorry, I'm trying to. It is hemp. Yeah, I believe all that. Yes, yeah, great. Hemp. Hemp contains about 0.3% tetrahydrocannabinol, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. A lot of the adults in the room, you know, I don't know if this young man's going to know it now. THC is how we say it for short, much easier. And it turns out that this oil is extracted from one particular species of hemp called cannabis saltiva. All right, and there's the oil. Let me see if I can show you a brief. Well, actually, no, I'll skip that. Let me go back. That's not that. It's, it's kind of a boring film, but it just shows an extraction process, but that's okay. We can move on. I've got better ones. All right. So I'm sure. Oops. I'm just getting familiar with this thing. Okay, slideshow. Where's from current slide? Oh, from the beginning. Not from the beginning. Down on the bottom. Oh, it's a little different from my from current slide slideshow. Maybe just if you click on it. This one. Ah, yeah, it's right. Now. Okay. Oh, it's just different from my computer. Sorry for the <laughs> technical difficulties. From uh, Oh, that's it. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Sorry, everybody. All right. Moving on. Here is Hemp Work 500. And let me ask you a question. Are you all familiar with how many? potential remedies have been advertised that CBD oil can cure? How many of you have heard? Have you heard it right? And what have, what have you heard? What are the things you've heard about in the media or um, elsewhere? Sounds about like ways? a redo of the 1900 snake oil. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else? Um, I know I was speaking Keep the earlier. Keep all in our... <laughs> <laughs> hey, young man! Was that a question? No. All right. Well, hang tight. We're going to have fun with you later. We've got some samples for you. Yes. Does the body naturally produce cannibal? cannibal? We're going to get to that, but let me go ahead. Since you asked, I'm going to jump ahead. So here's the thing, and we're going to get to this just as a teaser. Teaser alert. Um, yes, your body produces natural uh, compound called anandamide, and what it does the, 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 the cool thing about it is it helps you forget a lot of things that you are processing. So when I teach in class, I tell my students, this is how I teach them, sorry, I'm going to go into teacher mode for um, college students in a second. What I do is I say, imagine right now, everybody, that everything you're exposed to, you're remembering, like everything. <laughs> oh, you know, I remember the wall, I remember you, like, da, 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 you know, it's And there much. are some people who actually have that kind of Yes, <laughs> it's very rare, and that's a yeah. handicap. Yes, it's a disability. What your natural um, anandamide does is it helps repress all of the background noise that you would otherwise want to remember, but you can't because that would just blow your circuits, right? It's like trying to get a computer to run a thousand programs at one time. No, 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 you just want to focus on one. I want to focus on you. I don't want to be focusing on him, there, that, this, you know. So it helps kind of suppress those. In a way, it's a negative inhibitor of electrical stimulation that would cause you to, you know, be really alert and, you know, pay attention to everything you're being exposed to. So yes, you have it. We all have it. And it's a natural, natural part of our nervous system. And again, it's calming down a lot of the hyperactivity. It's funny you bring that up, too, because you're going to see later another teaser alert is that hemp oil, the one thing it's been proven to do is to help some forms of epilepsy. And I do want to frighten everybody here, so if any of you adults want to go online, there are actually uh, parents who post videos of their kids, unfortunately, having seizures, but they give them the drug, the CBD oil, and they come out of it. So think of that, it's calming down the electrical uh, hyperactivity that's occurring for specific seizure disorders. So 
you know, it's cool. It's really cool. We do. We have, when I teach, I say, you're making your own weed, everybody. And the kids just, oh, you know, I catch their attention. I said, well, it's an anti But, right, it can't do all of this. And you said snake oil. What she means is it can't cure everything, right? And here's the other problem. How many of you think that this is FDA regulated using this? Yes or no? It is not. It is not FDA regulated yet. That's right. So, hyper hemp? Eh, not sure yet. I think it's more hype than hemp. But, guess what? The FDA has approved and is tested. When the FDA tests something, as Americans, we have to be patient. I think our government has it right. Do we wish they could work faster? Absolutely. Go to the post office. Right? I'm sorry, there's no postal worker in here, I hope. But I'm just saying. Um, but it's for a reason, right? They've already tested this in animals. They've, they've done everything, human studies, ethically, of course. And now they know it's going to be safe for the vast majority of people who need to take what's called epidiolex. Um, and that is a first approved CBD oil that is used to treat epilepsy. So if we're patient, you know, these will come out and we'll be more trustworthy. The real hardcore science was done, FDA did it. Um, for, you know, now the latest thing is sleep. Uh, the latest um, hype, I guess, is that it is really effective for sleep. Um, again, it would be patient, and if you have a sleep problem, be patient. Hopefully within a year or two, as it's getting, you know, everything's just getting more and more, uh, it's getting more popular. Oh, I know that young lady. She works at my school. Oh, hey, I'm so happy you're here. Thank you. She's from Harris Stowe. Thank you for coming. I might have one of the incognito. So they're looking at it. <laughs> Is it restoring deep sleep? Or We're going to find out. I'm not really sure. I think it's restoring people who just, it could be REM. It could be mm -hmm. REM. We're going to use it for fly. Again, you are asking great questions. Your slides are hard to see, so this is a particular. <laughs> you know, that's a good question. Yeah. Do you because you it combines the epilepsy with, with yeah. the narcolepsy yeah. issue in the sleep. Yeah. And um, I have to be an expert on this because we're going to be applying for a grant. And actually, one of my students, I'll cheat. I'll go ahead. I'll show you right now. Because you brought it up. Let's see. What did I do with my, my toy? Ah. <laughs> this is like my last slide, but since you brought it up. Uh, I'm going to pass this around. I'll start. Well, since you asked, pass it around. Everybody had a chance. Since you asked the question, these little tubes hold fruit flies. One fruit fly in each tube. One fruit fly will go in each tube. And what this does is, you see, it's a circuit board. This, every time they cross through the middle, it sets up. It breaks the circuit. It's hooked up to a computer program. So every time they break the circuit, that means they're awake. They're going back and forth and then break oh, the circuit. counting their movements. Yes, it's Got counting it. their movements. Yeah. And the software gives you a plot. And when they're sleeping, hey, they're sleeping. They're not moving around. So that is what we're using, actually, fairly soon to see, feed them the CBD and see what effects it has on their sleep patterns. And you raise a good question. What, kind, what area of sleep, you know, what kind of sleep will it Effect. Can we get sleep mutants genetically and see what happens if we physiologically get, you know? So we're really excited about that. So I'm sorry you have that. I had a friend who had that. She was my friend in grad school. It drove her insane. Yeah, yeah, oh. I'm there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I felt so, yeah. It but I've done really that with rough. rats and mice. You know, they do the grid movements. And, you yeah, know, exactly. Not counting signature. Right, right. Absolutely. Neuropharmacology back. Sweet, me too, love it. Great, my postdoc. Yeah, it's Lou. It's Lou. It's Lou from you. I've got a little Slew slide in here. You'll see in a minute. It's gonna be cool. It's got a, my Slew billet, and he's got, um, he's got a blue shirt on. So, oh well, I gave that away. Um, go Blues, right? But this came out just last week, May thirtieth. Just last week, I'm right after Labor Day. The FDA actually and the hemp industry had a big hearing on regulating CBD, and they're now really getting more serious about how to classify the products um, with CBD in them. And so I tried to get you all a handout for that, but I couldn't find it, So, but I tried. But if you're interested, again, this is something you could, you could look. So while the controversy, I mean, so far, there's a lot of promise, right, for CBD oil. Um, so. Well, why? Well, that's why, right? Mm -hmm. 
it always had, I mean, you all know this, it's always had a negative connotation. I'm from Texas. I know stories about Willie getting pulled off I-35. <laughs> all right, my, um, my brother-in-law is an assistant chief of the Austin police, so I've heard these stories. Guys hung over I-35, smoking weed. Now, Willie, why do you keep doing this? It's in the slammer. But, so it's this negative connotations, right? Up in smoke, that's an old movie. Um, a lot of artists, Bob Marley is a little associated. Um, reggae with, with, he spoke weed. Puff the Magic Dragon. Yeah, I had no idea when I was a kid. No, I played no. this record all the time. I had no idea what it meant. Yeah, I'm sorry if you didn't know, but supposedly Puff is puffing, you know. And it was in the 60s, you know, the drug <clears throat> revolution of the 60s. For that young man, he's just a beautiful director. And he's just magical. So we have to break the stigma, right? We have to break the stigma. Because the whole taboo thing just tells us we need to be educated, that's all, right? That's what education is, power. You know, it's power. Education is power to break the stigma. And this is showing that the stigma is starting to break. Because this is, um, from 216, and I put a little smiley face on Missouri, um, showing now um, medical use, or in, uh, at least medical use, has been approved, right? The darker green is medical and rec, of course, Colorado, California. And so you're starting to see a wave of acceptance and um, hopefully less stigma. One could argue, I've heard this before, I'm sure you've maybe thought of this, drinking alcohol is probably worse than having a smoke. I don't know. I don't, I don't do this. I don't do this. I'm a goody goody. I've never touched it. But, um, you know, it certainly is going to have some benefits when used properly. So, a refresher. Remember that um, cannabis sativa, what we're talking about today, this is the kind of weed that is cultivated for hemp. And the reason the United States lets us have this, like in St. Louis today, right? You can go anywhere you want, Crab Adam, yada yada, is because it naturally doesn't contain much of the psychoactive compound, which is the tetrahydrocannabinol or THC. It's only 0.3, and they say that's fine because it's only that 0.3%. They don't, turns out you don't take the leaves, you just take the stalks and you compact them down. You send them off to whatever mom and pop shop, startup who's starting their own business, or big company, and then they extract the oil from there. That's why it's legal. Um, they are not using cannabis indica. This is the one that's cultivated for medical and recreational uses, and it's going to contain a lot higher amount of this uh, THC, 2 to 20%. All right. And it's also mainly from the buds of the flower and the female buds of the flower of the buds. So it's a whole other, um, I hate to say animal, we're talking about plants, but it's a whole other um, application for that species. What are cannabinoids? Well, it turns out when they take hemp and they compact it and they extract the oil, it's not clean. So let me warn you, for those of you who want to go buy some, and I brought some and passed that around too, it's legal. I ain't trouble. This is totally legal. I've got two flavors. And I've got this really for Harris Stowe because we're working with this in the labs. So I'll start with, with you to be fair. Give you a chance if you want to open and smell it. Um, it's an oil, so you have to dissolve it. I'll start with you. You're welcome to open and smell it. One of this is in hemp oil, and the other uh, is in made in peppermint. I think pepper, no, uh, coconut oil. And so. What I'm going to warn you about, each of those, how much do you think they cost? $50. You're absolutely right. 50 bucks. $54 at Mr. Nice Guy. <laughs> oh, gee, well, then I got a break, huh? I didn't have a coupon. Well, let me tell you what. Be very careful. Don't order from Amazon. I'll tell you already. I learned don't order from them. <laughs> They're not selling very good stuff. This, I'm not even sure about. It claims to have X amount of... Uh, thank you very much. So he is a former biology teacher, and he's right. It's not that pure. So for us to do experiments in Aristo with our model system, which we'll get to soon, the fruit fly, I have to order for the Sigma chemical, yeah. like an ultra-pure <coughs> form of it. 
With, and, and they have to do um, extra work to get rid of all the impurities. You're absolutely right. So you see what my problem is with this? There's impurities in there. So how safe is this stuff? You know, people are like taking it all the time, right? For stuff. So I, I want to wait for the FDA, but you know. So anything else here? Not really. All right. So I will show a short video. And why? Because I want to let you know there's a history of cannabis uh, in St. Louis. I bet you didn't know that. But we have a rich history. And that rich history, you'll see in this film, Dr. Lynn Howlett, actually who I met, uh, almost worked in her lab, um, she was the first one to actually show there's a receptor for, um, for THC. But I'll probably go over your head for some of you, because I know that all of your scientists, so hang tight. I'm going to explain that in a second. So let me show you this film. Anyway, so I just wanted you to see the Billiken slew. There he is, man. Go Blues. <laughs> Hopefully they win tonight. Hopefully the revs are fair. All right, cannabinoid oil, then. Not psychoactive, but now you're getting a better appreciation for its potential. And what are receptors? We're looking at CB1, CB2 receptors. This gets us into the brain, and you guys know how complex the brain is. It's organized in the very specific regions, and we're going to spend a lot of time here. But just to illustrate, the main point that I want to illustrate is that many regions of the brain express what are called receptors. These are like, I'm going to actually show you, I brought my, ha my baseball glove and mitt to illustrate the lock and key um, idea of receptors and the um, chemicals they bind to. So classically, when you teach about receptors, the ligand here would be THC, let's say, right? And the receptor would be this. And it's expressed on a cell. And it's outside of the cell, poking out like an antenna. And that's an old school, because we don't have antennas anymore, do we? And it grab onto that very specifically. It would have to fit. That's a square. And here it's showing, here is a very beautiful fit of this protein shaped in a Y to greet and hang on tightly to this um, ligand, or in our case, we're talking about THC, right? And so the way I usually teach this in class, haha, is I say, here we go. This is this knit, and I bet you love baseball. What's your name? Do you mind me asking? Uh, David. David. Great. David, do you play baseball? No. Okay, well, one day you might. All right. This, I'm the cell, and I'm sticking this out, looking for my THC, my ligand. This is THC, right? Boom. Binds perfectly well. Let's say it's an andamide. It's in your internal stuff. Let's just switch it. This is in your brain. It's in, you'll see in the next slide, it's in a lot of organs of your body, believe it or not, this receptor, this myth. And so... It's catching your native and the end of mine quite well. But let's suppose a softball came along. THC. Mm, might compete with this and it might just do a fine dandy job and give you a nice little psychoactive effect, huh? That's how it works. Okay, that's how it works. Now, then you might have, well, I had a ping pong ball, but you get the point, right? This is a very specific pocket in the cells make to grab on, latch on to very specific chemicals to make your brain do what it does. To excite your brain, to calm your brain down. All the circuitry is regulated by these kinds of, this is real easy, trust me. If y'all want to earn a PhD, young man, you go to school, learn a PhD and learn this, there's hundreds of these kinds of things. I'm already learning. at school. <laughs> Wonderful, that's good, you stay in school and be smart. It's very important. Um, that's just a repeat, so we'll skip it, but it's just showing. This, however, once again, illustrating not just in your brain, but in your fat, your adipose tissue, your muscles, your liver, your GI tract. All of these have this receptor in the cells of the tissues. It's going to grab on to what you're smoking or what you're drinking. Um, and then um, that's CB1. There's another specific kind of receptor, it's a little different, that binds to... Um, it's ligands, and it's mainly expressed in the immune system. So your whole body is just geared 
to be reacting to these chemicals. And I don't want to overkill it, but again, it's a lock and key kind of thing. There we go, it's just a connection, I got it. I'll skip this, but it's a, it's a very, very um, interesting system, how we've co-evolved with these plants, right, to um, discover that they are going to affect our physiology. I think that's fascinating, fascinating. So we've already talked about this, so I'm going to skip it, because um, remember, you asked very early, um, so yeah, we were way, you were way ahead, but that's, anandamide is the natural substance your body makes, let's just keep going, and move on to the fun stuff. Why are we using fruit flies to study CBD? This is why, and that number is actually not correct. It's actually about more like 70%. 70% of your genes have a counterpart in the fly, okay? When I joke with my students, I, they are little humans. Be nice to them, okay? They're little humans. And because of genetics, there's so much conservation, you can actually use these little insects to learn a lot about how biology works, how um, these oils, how CBD oil might be affecting their behavior and their physiology. We have a lot of tools. I don't have another hour for a lecture on it, but it's a powerful model system. It's got a short life cycle, okay? It's only 10 days. If you're gonna study this in rats or mice, they cost a lot of money, to, to, and you've got months and months of work to do, if not years. Uh, with flies, you know, a couple of weeks, you might have some answers about what's going on. Um, this is just a picture showing that also, although they are insects, they are sharing a lot of the physiology we have. And we're specifically looking at the nervous system now for our studies in the fruit fly. And this slide is just a, a laundry list of all the different things you can use the fruit fly for as a first pass. Okay? I'm not boohooing all the other animal model systems. Of course we need them. But what, what gets me is the pharmaceutical industry should really be looking at these flies. Anybody work pharmaceutical in here? You know why? It cost me a penny a fly. Yeah. And you can do your first screen with these, whatever drugs you're looking at, get some ideas, then you go into, you know, you find a gene. Oh, this gene's being affected by CBD oil. You know, we find this gene. You look for the gene in humans. You know, you start to compare between, wow, we found this in a fly. How does it apply in mice? How does it apply in humans? And a lot of the modern biology and cures started with fruit fly, believe it or not, especially in cancer. Nobody knows that. But there's a little fruit fly with its powerful genetics that really made huge impacts in medicine and in science. So this is just showing you could find what a gene does with a fly. You just make a mutant. I want to know what the CD1 receptor in flies does. Knock it out. Let's see what happens. You can make mutants out of these things, um, all kinds. So um, they're very powerful. Now, do you think in our lab we're going to have them doing this? <laughs> I don't think so. Although I thought about it. <laughs> I thought of vaping, because you know, all the, that too is a little problematic. Kids, everybody's vaping. That's a whole other drug, and i got my hands full with this. Um, but yeah, I thought of that. I'd give me an atmosphere of a little vape, but that's for another 10 years, I guess. <laughs> so moving on. So no, it turns out, and I brought, here's my other toy. I'm going to just show it really quick. Um, that's not a slide. But this is a poster of their life cycle. And what I told my students is, Turns out they have a maggot phase, but don't call them maggots, they're fruit flies. We call them larvae. They're so much nicer. But they have a crawly stage. And I know you're bored, young man, and I'm not. Oh, no, I'd be if I were you. Golly. I was a kid once. I don't know what you're going through. Have a look at those. Those are larvae. Ew. Yeah, those are larvae. So you can pass those around when you're done. Those are larvae. Just don't pop that lid. Or the library people will be very angry with me, I'm sure. I'll never come back again. But so they've got a 10 day life cycle. They go through phases like a butterfly. They get to the pupil stage and hatch out. But long story short, because I know I gotta move on. I gotta move along, but anyway, long story short, we're looking at the nervous system here, and I told my students, start with the larva. They're transparent. I brought them there. So if anybody wants to see them soon, we'll put them under a microscope and look at them. You can see right through them, you can see their nervous system, you see everything. And let's see if they have any problems. And so we're looking at the nervous system. This is just uh, for those of you um, 
I'm sure a lot of you know what neurons are, but uh, for those of you who just want a reminder, they're like little circuits and they just send electrical signals, right? So what were our methods? Well, I did bring my cage. I'll pass this around. Once again, we'll start with you, you're handy. That's a fly cage. You put a bunch of adult flies in there, give them food, and they can breathe because there's a net at the top. And then what we do is we let those flies lay eggs. All right, and here's the life cycle, once again, that I tried to show you in the poster. For 15 minutes. Okay, why do you think we do that? Why do you think we just let them lay an egg for 10 to 15 minutes? You know why? Because we let them just lay eggs anytime they wanted. They'd all be different ages. It's just like going to Barnes Jewish, it'd be a paternity word, right? And Mama, Mama A had the baby at 7 a.m., but Mama B had the baby two days later. Well, it was humans. It's not a good analogy. But what I'm trying to say is we do it in a short time so they're all the same age. Mm -hmm. And then as they mature to this area, they're all about the same age. If you're doing a study, you've got to be tight with your ages. Because in your sophomore world, if we're off by so many hours, we're actually looking at a preteen versus an 18-year-old. And that, that physiology could be very different for those of you who are parents, right? <laughs> The same, the same here. So I always tell my kids, no, no, it's got to be a tight collection. And then you let them mature. And we take them at about the third and star stage. Now, we do this either with those cages. Or what you'll see today is I'll actually brought. Uh, we can also do a 15-minute egg lay. I'm going to pass all these around. This is CBD. 0 0.002 mix per mil CBD. And you can see they ate it. No problem. They ate it. They developed well. Um, we dissolved it in coconut oil, so I do have the control here. This is the coconut oil control, just the coconut oil alone, just to show that the vehicle we used is not what's causing any issues physiologically. Pass that around. So there you go. And you can see almost every stage in there, literally in those in those tubes. Mm. All right. Here are my students in class. This was biology um, 152 at Harris Stowe. They're actually doing a study, and I was going to show you a film, but I'll explain for we're running out of time, and I'd like you to play on the table there. What larvae do? How many of you ever played with a slinky? You know what a slinky is? It's got that movement. Okay, well imagine a sinusoidal movement, or that old inchworm. Remember the inchworm? That's what they do. They crawl like this, and they do a cycle. And so what the kids do, basically, is they take... One of these behavioral plates, it's just jello, kind of a jello auger, stiff. And then what they do is they take, they take this little forcep, they pick the third and star larva out, they put it on that plate, and then they put the plate under this microscope, which shines a light from below. You see the beautiful transparent larvae, so maybe you want to see this before you leave, we'll set a few up. Start the little timer. They give it 30 seconds to crawl around. Just get used to its environment. And then for one minute, this is so simple. Undergraduates, high school students, elementary students could do this. So if anybody's a teacher and wants to do this, it's easy. Click how many times to go. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da -da, for one minute. Now, if you're at Wash you have a ton of money. You just track it, right? <laughs> you find some nice software program and take a video and do it that way. I'm going to add my hair still, but I am, I am, I'm, I'm applying for a grant, so hopefully we'll get all that fancy stuff. So what happened here? So what I was just talking about are called body wall contractions. So what I did, what this graph shows, this will be our y-axis, is the average number of contractions that these larvae uh, had for one minute, as I just demonstrated. Very easy. This is a control just with coconut. And this is, these are 10 animals, by the way, 10 here and 10 here again an average and a standard deviation. No statistics yet. We have to repeat this a few more times. Now, for those of you adults with a keen sense of biology, you know how this one dose. This is like Neuro Farm. We have to do the whole range. Now, do remember, this is a class of 20 students, and they have them make fly food and make the drugs. It is horrendous. I was like, oh, you know how we got through it. So to get this was really something. But now this summer, my students are devoted. We can do different doses. We can, you know, repeat this many times and do the statistics. Another interesting 
uh, behavior that we can track are called Malto contractions. Again, I'll spare the video, but do you see these hooks? Mandibles. Thank you. We call them mouth hooks, but you're absolutely right. It's mandibular. Um, underneath here, you can't see it, but the mouth is under here. We call it the oropharynx. So when they grab their food, they do this. They put it in their mouth. And it's a circuit. It's a, it's a, it's a motor circuit, just like crawling is a motor circuit. Motor circuit. There's different circuits. We're looking at motor. All right, there's others. But this one is a circuit, too. So we count how many times you do this for a minute. Same thing. One, two, and they're fast. Like I said, you know. And so, okay. So let's look at what happens if we feed this early stage um, CBD oil. Ha! Ah, look at that. Ten animals again. I don't want to hang my coat on that. I'm a scientist. This was a class. Okay? We want to repeat this three, five times. Get all this data together. Make sure that we have good hands. Make sure our students are not on their cell phones. We talked about that earlier. Focusing, getting it right. But it does appear, before we do stats, just preliminary, very preliminary, no, no flag waving, there might be an effect. That's interesting. And so they always say, well, gee, what do cannabinoids know to do when people smoke weed? And you hear it usually eat more. <laughs> I know. I know. And that's why this is mystifying to me. That's mystifying to me. I don't know. That's, yes, absolutely. But look, well, exactly. What's going on here? That, and let, you know what? She raises a good point. What does that tell you? Science can be so exciting because nine times, 99 times out of 100, it's not going to be what you think. It's going to be something, a different result, and that's what makes it fun. It's like a puzzle. you got to figure it out. Just a puzzle. Who knows? Yes, absolutely. Thirty percent. I could tell the whole story about sugar and Coca-Cola, but that's another talk. <laughs> Dose dependence. You're right. I'm not going to waste time. A lot of you know, and I hope you have not smoked. So I, I, I don't want to know, but but, but what I, my brother has. Okay, I just give it away. My little brother. He's an artist. Uh, he's a musician. They all do. Um, yeah, I can say he's had all this and the motility issues and that kind of thing. Um, so I'm just, why doesn't it kill? So somebody said facts, myths, I took those slides out. It turns out you don't have very many cannabinoid receptors in your brain or in your brain stem. And so really, no matter what you take, um, you're unlikely to disrupt um, your physiology um, with overdosing because you just don't have enough to overdose. You don't just make enough. You make enough to help you get through life. but. Apparently not enough that you can bind all of them, you know, and, and get, you know. So what's our some, some research? We want to focus on these uh, locomotive behaviors, and then we want to look at the adult flies as well for locomotion. That's the final stage. They hatch out and look at their sleep behaviors because this is really what's going to be publishable and more relatable to what the current research is going in, in I think mammalian systems. So there he is sleeping. I already showed you the assay system. And I'm going to wrap it up there, but I'll take any questions you want. I wish I had more time. I brought a lot of fun stuff. So if you want to hang out by the table, if you have time, I'll show you it. I just quickly, I'll get to your question. I want to thank Dr. Dwayne Smith, who was um, instrumental in getting these very large multi-million dollar grants for Harrisville State. We just got another $2.5 million um, for our implementation. And that money gets funneled down to undergraduate students to do research. And now we're pushing for entrepreneurship. And so it kind of, we're all involved. I mean, he's the one who got it, but everybody helps write, and it's a team effort. So I'm really proud of our school and of our department and Harris Stowe for letting me play around, uh, letting me do what I want. My administrators don't care. Have fun. Just do it. Um, <laughs> teach well, and I, we don't care. We'll get you a lab. It will happen. So I know it's happening soon. So I want to acknowledge in the National Science Foundation, of course, and my class who did a great job.